lots of articles this morning in your morning papers about the civil war brewing in West London at Chelsea with a power struggle going on in the boardroom between two of the main players in this huge consortium that owns the club. Now, there are two big groups. There's Todd Bowley's sort of mini consortium, which is of two or three different people, hans your Voos and uh, somebody else as well who's involved in his consortium, silent partners, and he's the sort of front man of that group. And then there's Begdag Ebali, who runs the Clear Lake Capital, controls the Clear Lake Capital arm of the... Um, what is a, in a sense a huge consortium that owned Chelsea I think Begdad Barley's group's got 62% Todd Bowley's group's got 31% and then there's minor shareholders that make up the rest of it but um, there seems to be a little bit of a row brewing between the two they don't get on they've been battling between themselves about how the running of the club should be there's a little bit of an argument about who is the public face of it you you already know about the story that they're going to swap the chairmanship every five years Todd Bowley's got this vision he says for Chelsea to become a, a super club over 30 years and he's got a, a, a plan of how to do that but he wants to be in control of it whereas Begdag Egbali's got a different vibe and all the big decisions have to be signed off by both parties and that's why sometimes things take a little bit longer I think Egg Barley's closer to Paul Wynn Stanley and Lawrence Stewart, who are the two sporting directors. And then you've got Todd Bowley, who's almost sort of stepped back from the day-to-day of the club. Having been at the ground, and you've been there too, I've noticed when I'm in the tunnel that the, the reverence to Egg Barley is quite high and Egg Barley will storm up and down the tunnel, get involved in whatever, and he'll, he'll go past us and sometimes go into the dressing room himself. So, um, look, I, I don't know... What's caused this last thing to happen, whereas it's spilt out into public, but it's pretty clear that all is not well. What's the upshot here? Well, just when you thought that they've gone down a route that no one's ever gone down before, so you're thinking there must be a cunning plan here, suddenly there's fractions between the the owners. So it's almost as if someone is realising the philosophy they've gone down since they've come in isn't the right thing to do because they want to do it their way or another way you know th- they may have this cunning plan of you buy Chelsea for two and a half billion pounds and in five ten years time it's worth double triple that and they make their money back That's but it f- doesn't seem to be the same cunning plan they seem to have two different cunning plans well this plans. is what I mean and so, is, this the, is this the issue because you know, Premier League football clubs are now so expensive that you're paying you, you just said two and a half billion pounds but actually if Bowley's going to buy out Egg Barley he's going to pay two point five billion for it so it's already increased in value yeah. so they're already going to get a profit on it if they were to sell it now he says he's not going to do that Egg Barley he's got absolutely no no reason to sell he doesn't want to sell he wants to stay there Bowley says the same thing they both can't have it it's one of them has to move on because they're not going to work together but is this the sort of taste of what consortium ownership looks like in the Premier League now because they're so expensive the, the, the entities are so expensive that you need several people to put in money and the issue comes is that the, the lots of people that have the money to do it or have to come together to do it have got huge egos and they all think they're right <laughs> absolutely absolutely and do you know what Sam it's getting to the point where certainly at top end Premier League level you have to be multi-billionaires to do it and if you're a multi-billionaire what's the point of going in with someone and you don't have full control because as a businessman, you become a multi-billionaire by doing things your way. You're the boss, and, and if people don't go with you, then you get rid of them. Suddenly, you're going into business with someone on a something completely different. It may be sport, but it's not baseball. It, it's English football. You're going down a route of spending over, what is it, $1.2 billion? Okay, they've, they, they, they've sold a, a good few hundred million, but it's still a lot of money um, that they've spent and and look at what the the team is doing on the pitch. So the bottom line is, if you've got like this cunning plan, at least be together with it. If you're that after two and a bit years, there's fractions between the owners. What are the fans meant to think? The fans are already seeing their team regressing from where they were when when the owners came in. So this does not bode well because, as you say, there's going to be one set of billionaire who doesn't want to sell and wants control. You've got the other set of billionaire who doesn't want to sell and wants control. This doesn't look good for for Chelsea in the short and medium term. It it really doesn't. When already on the pitch, I felt if Poch was still in charge, 
I, I've not been able to give her who I think will finish fourth. And, and by the way, I still can't now. I can give arguments why a lot of teams won't finish fourth, but no one stood out and said to me, this team's going to finish fourth. Chelsea, for me, would have been finishing fourth if Potter still in charge. They were, the, they were the fourth best team in the Premier League from December to the end of last season. Now they've got Maresco in, who I think is a very good coach, but is very inexperienced and now is being told with 40-odd players... At least he's trying to grab a little bit of sense of control by saying, look, I'm just going to have in training 22 players. Whatever happens with everybody else after that is it, or on the side is nothing to do with me. He's trying to grab a little bit of control, but it's it's out of control. Oh, and it's oh, become even more so now with the owners not even on the same page. Well, this is the key thing. Isn't it? I think we are relatively sensible in the way that we're assessing the situation. But out of control is just about... The tip of the iceberg, isn't it? This is a club that, at the moment, at this moment in time, are in a chaotic mess. If you look at the squad, the stature of the team in 2021 when they won the Champions League, and where they are now as a group in 2024, at the beginning of the 2024 season, it is markably different as a whole club. Now, obviously, there was a massive change that came about with a change of ownership when you had someone who had run the club in a certain way over a number of years with trusted allies that were all buying into the methods that he was employing top to bottom. Marina Granskaya was running the club on a day-to-day -day basis. Bruce Buck was there to lean on as a, as a, as a sort of uh, overseeing eye. Since Petr Cech too. Petr Cech was there as a technical director. But since the new group have come in, they've changed absolutely everything. And all of that football experience has gone out of the door. And you've got a situation where you've had five first-team men's manager. You have allowed the best female coach, probably in club women's football, to leave. And that happened because you didn't make her feel as if you were going to make it better and kick on from where you were. That I, I'm pretty on safe, pretty safe ground there to say that. Um, and by allowing all of those people to to go, plus all of all but two of the academy graduates that are high profile in the first team have all been sold off as well for great profit, by the way. At the same time, you, you've you've got a, a situation where the expertise is gone, a lot of the historical expertise is gone. You've got no consistency in the dugout at either club. Obviously, it's a new new chapter for the women's team, but there's been a lot of new chapters for the men's team over the course of the last two or three years. And you've got a completely new squad of players who have got to get used to yet another new coach and another new way of playing. There needs to be, and I think Mark Cucurea said this on international duty, a, a semblance of calmness. You are not going to get that if everybody is fighting above you. Egg Barley's fighting with Bowley. Paul Wynn Stanley and Lawrence Stewart are competing to be Beg Begdali's biggest influence. I didn't know you could have two sporting directors, by the way. Or they you had can, three at one stage. Can, but... they, they moved one on. But it does seem it's chaotic. It's a chaotic mess. Yeah. Look, they've come in and they've wanted to go down a different route, haven't they? They've wanted to go down the, the sort of... What route's that? The road to the championship? Well, no, you know, look. Roman Abramovich ran That's it. That's me a, being facetious, yeah. I know, but it is a little bit frustrating Ro watching it. Roman Abramovich ran eyes. it in a very, very ruthless way in terms of, you know, if if the manager falls out the top four, he's getting sacked. So it's not necessarily a oh, you know, managers come and go. This is different from the past. But what he was able to do was give these managers the best in class, ready-made, world-class, senior pros, players who could do the job, and the ones that have come in now. Are literally buying youngsters. But here, I don't there, even think I don't even think that's the comparison. I think I think I think the actual issue here is is that you've got people that have come in from the outside of the game that have never been involved in football before in their lives, like never ever been involved on a day to day basis with football. Right? They've come in and they've dictated the policy of how the football club is going to be run based on another system of economics and another system of sporting. Uh, prowess so they've taken ideas from baseball it doesn't translate it does it does had, not Sam, translate I've been saying this for over a year and actually the the mistakes that they've made are mistakes in the way they have applied whatever other lessons they've taken from other areas of business into a football setting what they should have done and it's easy to say with hindsight because we're not we're not multi-billionaires and i'm sure if we were we would make stupid emotional mistakes as well you're just a billionaire 
Yeah, sort of. Uh, only only an enrichment in terms of <laughs> like you know, in love. joy. Um, yeah, um, you would. You, you, you would ask someone who was an expert to come in and run your business, right? If you'd taken over a business, if I, if I had loads of money and I went and bought, I don't know, an accountancy firm, I'd probably em- employ, employ a really good in- accountant to run the business for me. Listen, a strength can be a weakness. Their strength is them in the business being extremely successful and becoming a billionaire. You don't tell a billionaire what to do. The billionaire thinks he, he, he kind of knows it all. So how do you persuade a billionaire that actually the baseball of buying just as many youngsters as possible and then almost, you know, dealing out cards and saying, having little swaps and we'll do this. Okay, you can have him, I'll have him. And that's going to not affect the football side of things in a at a club where, which is why I refer back to the Abramovich era of it's all about the here and now. It's nothing about the future. And we'll worry about the future in the future because we'll, we'll continue to buy ready-made world-class players. This is nothing about the here and now. This is all about the future. But the problem is, when does the future become the present? They're kicking the can down the road all the time with these players and they're not quite understanding from the football side, again, the bigger picture may be for them, which is still worrying for Chelsea fans, that 2.5 billion becomes 5 to 10 billion in 10 years' time. But what about what goes on on the pitch? The best thing to do is to create stability and that's something which they've not been able to have because the manager keeps on going and the new manager coming in is not giving best in class. So you, you talk about Mikhailo Mudrik, who, who Arsenal wanted. He's a great footballer. but there's I'm not sure he is, but you know, he, he's certainly not showing it. I think, there, I think, there's I think a great he'd be a lot better in, in an Arsenal shirt than he would in a Chelsea but shirt. I think, I think it's a sad indictment of Chelsea. I think, there is a, I think he's got loads of things going on in his life and I think he's got loads of things going on externally from the game which need to be taken care of and he needs to be taken care of in a certain way in order to get the best it's out of it. It's one example, Sam. There's, there's a number of players who you're waiting to actually come and this is why Cole Palmer, for me, was player of the season last season. You know, Phil Foden, amazing. Rodri, amazing. Declan Rice, amazing. But to do it in these toxic kind of situations where the shirt weighs so heavy, where the fans have been incredibly patient but are starting to get impatient with what they're seeing because there's such an inconsistency... That kid, I'm telling you now, was nothing short job. of sensational. Absolutely, last he did brilliantly. But so, what's the future? What, what, where does it go from here? Because it, until they resolve the boardroom issue, you can't really resolve everything else. Because Absolutely. they've still got loads of players that they're not going to use next year. Right? You got you got players that are going to sit at Cobham in the canteen and not be able to eat with the the other first yeah, team ben players. Chilwell that's still ben Chilwell still there. Chilwell. Isn't he? What's he going to do with life? Who I think is an excellent left back, by the way. <laughs> if he was playing for Chelsea, he'd probably be playing for England at this and, moment and in I, time. I, I, this is where Enzo Maresca, it, it, it's a really difficult situation for him. I mean, I, I've... They've sent I, Sterling to Arsenal. They're paying 70% of his wages. Ridiculous. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. How can, how can someone not be good enough for Chelsea? And by the way, he hasn't been great for Chelsea, but suddenly you've got Arsenal willing to take him on. And, and, and actually, from a financial point of view, be, what, 30% of the wages. I mean, it just... It just... It beggars belief. Where does Chelsea go from here? Until these two can sort it out, can't go anywhere. And that's extremely worrying because at least we thought there's a cunning plan here and actually at some point in the future they'll either the cunning plan will come to fruition or they'll realise it's Did not working. Know, I, I, no, I, remember, no, I was looking or, at the recruitment and I was thinking to myself there's not one of these players that I'm really thinking is a massive upgrade on what Chelsea already had in the building. They've got rid of Jorginho, Sterling and Havertz and they've gone to Arsenal who arguably are the second best team in the league at this moment in time. No, if not they're arguable. Good, if they're good enough to be in the second best team in the league, or even in the squad for the second best team in the league, they're, they're good enough to be on Chelsea's books right now. It just seems utterly strange. It, it seems to me that they're doing things from an accountancy point of view without understanding football and how it works. And again, that's what we're seeing with the turnover of managers. And look, I, I don't think Maresca has got himself in a position where he's merited being Chelsea manager. He's only been a, in management for just over a year. He's had two jobs, one at Palmer and he got sacked after I three months. I don't blame him for Palmer what happened and behind the at, scenes. And one at Leicester where well, he, he had the best squad in the championship. He did, and he won the league. But he is a very good coach, but he hasn't merited being what, what we think where Chelsea should be. But Maybe he we've has got, got to reassess. Maybe we've got to go back to your day. Oh, I can't, no, I can't be that desperate, surely. <laughs> can't be that desperate. Rude, where are you? Where, where's Rude? What's he doing now? Let's get him back. God, those were the days. I was actually, you know, I was, I was, I was flicking through Pat Nevin's book and uh, it reminded me of where Chelsea were when I first started watching football. And, you know, 
No, but we're no, still but in a, no, we're still no, in a much Sam. better position. No, no, Sam, that's not the point, though. Well, Life has moved it's on, it's all moved absolutely, on. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and you've got to think about where Chelsea were just a few seasons ago. Yeah. You know, Champions League winners in 2021. And, we got and a break, I'm, but I'm worried even more for them now. This has come out on AM, on DAB, via the Talksport app, and on your smart speaker. Talksport.